Good morning, or whatever time it might be when you're watching this. I'm Jack Starr. I get to be pastor here at Osceola United Methodist, and we welcome you to this service. Uh, this service, it's, it's the weekend of July, it's not July, it's June 21st, it's Father's Day. <laughs> That, that's why I'm all uh, abstracted and, and uh, confused today. Anyway, we welcome you to the service at Osceola United Methodist. And it's a delight to have you with us this morning as we join in a little time of worship and some reflection of the word and, uh, and some time to pray together. And so thank you for joining us online. Uh, let's, uh, let's begin with singing a, a great old gospel uh, gospel song, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. that we may hear you clearly. Strengthen our spirit that we may have the courage to answer your call. Be present in this time of worship and draw us closer to you. Amen. That's our prayer at all times, that we might be drawn closer um, to our Lord and Savior, being drawn closer to God. There are a few things. Um, as I said, I wanted to welcome you uh, this morning or whatever time you are uh, joining us for this. A couple of announcements that I, that I want to uh, bring up, first of all. Uh, it is Father's Day, so I hope you enjoy this day, that you take some time to enjoy this day uh, with family as, as much as it is possible. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, this week, on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we've been having an afternoon Bible study on the Beatitudes. Here's something new. We've been doing it as a Zoom uh, Bible study. We're going to try to gather at the church. It will be either out on our patio, if the weather's good for that, or in the fellowship hall. It's a, it's a relatively small group, and so we are going to social distance. We're asking people to wear their masks, and we're sort of trying out the idea of meeting together. And so that will be Tuesday at 1 o'clock here at the church. Uh, also this week, uh, that is another sort of experiment, and that's going to be next week, next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We will be gathered here at the church for our, uh, our first gathered service uh, in a long time. We will be gathering outside. We'll be out in the out in the garden, our lawn, 
That way we'll be able to spread around, spread out quite a bit out in the yard. Um, we are asking everybody to wear masks. Uh, we're going to uh, have a, a chance to, well, I'll need some volunteers. So if somebody could give a call, give me a call, uh, who would be, want to be a helper as an usher or a greeter that would give any of the people who come to the service some guidelines about where we'll need to sit and things like that. So give me a call this week if you can help out in that way. Uh, but when you come, bring some lawn chairs. Uh, we do have a few seats, but it, it's often more comfortable if you bring your own lawn chair and then we can spread out. And uh, I think that's just a chance. We're gonna, again, we're going to be trying that out. That's not going to be the first of a whole list, uh, a whole series of, of services that will be gathered here. The, the following week, we will go back to just being exclusively online and we'll be talking about what we need to do, how we can, how we can work as a gathered service. But that's uh, next week on June 28th, we invite you to come here at 10 o'clock in the morning for our, for our gathered worship service, an outdoor service. Uh, so you probably should bring sunscreen and a sun hat and sunglasses and uh, as as long as your mask and lawn chairs and whatever for being outside. So that's coming up. Um, in between that, on Friday, as we've been doing for the last couple of Fridays at the church here, uh, in our parking lot on the corner of River Street and Fourth, we are the host of the Osceola Farmers Market, and so that's uh, that's a. A fun event and I just got some wonderful strawberries there and so that's um, I know there's a lot of good stuff I invite you to come I invite you to invite your friends to come we're um, we're really trying to be very careful in this time of getting together everybody coming into the farmers market is wearing masks we're keeping distance but it's um, it's great to come to that every uh, every Friday when we have the farmer's market, I'm also looking for a volunteer who might be able to be a host and just be here. There's not much that you need to do, just kind of relax and be around here to help uh, any of the vendors if they need help or if there's anything that is needed as, as it is on our church grounds. So that's on, on Friday. Give me a call if you can help out, if you can be this, this week. Uh, speaking of volunteers, we do, oh, through the next few weeks, need some folks who will volunteer to take care of our lawn, uh, to mow the lawn, to do the gardening. Thanks to Lorelei who did that mowing last uh, this last week. And um, so if, if you can help with that. Those are, I think, are just a few of the things to, to let you know about. Uh, let's take some time to pray. I invite you to, uh, to lift up the activities of our church and the people of our church. And, um, well, let's just take now. We've, I've, over the week, I've received some word that, uh, uh, some, some concerns that we want to lift up in prayers. And so I will, <clears throat> I will lift those up. I'll try to group a bunch together. And then I will say, Lord, in your love, and I invite you, wherever you are, to say, hear this, our prayer. Join me in saying that. And so that's a way we can all lend our support and our prayers uh, to those prayers that are coming here. So if you would, let's take some time now to pray. Gracious God, thanks for your grace to us, for your love for us. Thank you that we can talk to you anytime and any place. Thank you for reminding us that you are with us in any time and in any place and that you go with us through the darkest times of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we don't actually need to pray for you to know all of our needs. But we also thank you, Lord, that you've made it, that we need to pray so that we can draw near to you every day and at all the time. And so that's what we're doing. Thank you that even though spread far apart, we can unite our hearts and our voices in turning to you. And so this morning, Lord, we want to lift up some, some loved ones and friends and uh, some of the 
some of the needs that we're aware of. So Lord, we pray for the grace and wisdom among our leaders who are trying to find ways and ways of bringing healing and recovery to cities where there has been violence and where there continue to be protests. We pray for wisdom and for real solutions to the injustice, for the inequality, uh, for as, as communities struggle to understand how to make life fair for everyone who is living there. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. Lord, we lift up to you those who are uh, those who are hurting, those who are recovering from illness, and those who are in the midst of illness, those who have had procedures and are recovering from them. We lift up Marie, who's now at home, now in her new home, recovering from knee surgery, and for Amy going through radiation for cancer. For Sherry, whose surgery on her knee is, is on June 22nd, is coming just tomorrow. For Mark Kozlak and, and his health. And for all of those others in our church family and beyond who need your healing touch. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are in transition. For, uh, for Marie in her new home, for uh, Linda as she prepares to move, for Aurora as she is uh, becoming settled in Texas, for uh, Barb and Liera who have just been able to come into a new apartment, uh, for the Kellys as they prepare to move in just a couple of weeks. And for all others who are in times of some uncertainty because of transitions in their lives, Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who are working in the health care business, um, for care workers and emergency personnel and EMTs and doctors and nurses and um, the maintenance people and um, all of those who are involved with the health care business. We pray for care facilities like Christian community homes and others that are still under a deep quarantine because the risk is so much greater there. Lord, in your love, Hear this our prayer. Lord, we pray for local economies. We think especially of our own businesses as they try to find ways to operate in a safe way, in a socially acceptable way, in a way that might pull them out of uh, the economic uh, challenges that they've faced. And Lord, we pray for those who are needing to work in those circumstances. Sometimes it brings them in contact with a public that may not be that safe. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world where there is so much injustice and then where there is the problem of, of drought and of famine of disease and though we focus so much on the COVID-19 there are so many other diseases that are that threaten your children Lord we pray for the your people around the world who are struggling Lord in your love hear this our prayer we pray for leaders and there's so much focus on the disease, but there is also now a focus on figuring out ways to create equity in our cities and states and around our country. 
Father, we pray for leaders that they will work wisely with one another, that they will serve their nations and states and communities, and that they will reflect your grace in their work together. Lord, in your love, hear this up. Finally, Lord, we pray for us, for ourselves, that we will show the grace, that we will show the patience with one another as we, as we live through this time of uncertainty, this time that is still new to us as we try to explore new ways of being. Lord, we're your people and we pray that that will be apparent in the way we live. So use us as witnesses. Um, let us speak with grace and care and love and let us act in the same way so that all people might, in our very actions, be drawn to you. Thank you for your love, your gift of yourself to us. Bless us, Lord, that we may be a blessing to the world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. I'd like you to um, picture a pool, a swimming pool. There's a dad a few feet out into the pool, and his two-year-old daughter is standing by the side. She has been playing on the steps at the end of the pool and having a great time, but dad has called her to come out deeper. Her blonde curls and her red swimming suit are wet, and she stands by the side of the pool, shivering. And dad says, jump, I'll catch you. Now this is new for her. The little girl isn't sure. I mean, she's torn right at this moment between fear and trust. Jump, her father says, don't be afraid. You can trust me. I won't let you fall. So she's just a bundle of inner conflict. On one hand, everything inside her is saying, stay, stay put. The water's deep, it's cold, it's dangerous. She's never done this before. I mean, she can't swim. What if something were to go wrong? Bad things could happen. Yeah. On the other hand, it's her daddy out in the water. He's bigger and stronger than she is. He's been relatively trustworthy up to this point for her past two years. He seems to be pretty confident about the outcome. Yeah. He seems to know what he's doing. And so this battle is raging in her between fear and trust. Trust says jump, fear says no. She knows she can't stand by the side of the pool forever. And she comes to a moment of decision. She's more than her fears. Inside, a tiny spark of will determines her destiny. She's going to jump. Or wait, maybe she'll back away. I mean, whichever way this little girl decides, it will lead to some significant consequences in her life. I mean, more really than she or her daddy are thinking about at that particular time. If she decides to jump, she will become just a little bit more confident of her father's ability to catch her and more likely to leap the next time. The water will hold less terror for her and so will a lot of other scary things. Ultimately, she'll come to see herself as the kind of person who is not going to be held back by fear. If, on the other hand, she decides not to jump, that too will have some consequences. I mean, she will lose the opportunity to discover just how much her dad can be trusted. She'll be a little bit more inclined towards safety next time. She'll, she might begin to see herself as the kind of person who doesn't really respond bravely to challenges. 
And so she might find herself becoming more and more, well, working harder and harder to avoid being faced with decisions that might involve this kind of fear in the future. Yeah. We aren't even thinking about those consequences, those long-term consequences. Now, I want my kids to have a healthy fear of water. There is a place for fear in our world. But I want trust to be stronger. I, I don't ever want the no of fear to trump the yes of faith. So back to the pool. Well, once Leah made the jump, yeah, she made it. <laughs> she wanted to do it again and again and again and again and again. She wanted to try it farther away from the side and farther away yet and still farther until her dad was beginning to wonder if he, what he'd gotten himself into. I think it was actually her mother calling us in that saved me. But otherwise, we might still be leaping from the, yeah, uh, maybe not now, 30 years later. But, uh, but that simple little moment became one of the first examples of us uh, facing the, the decision between fear and trust. Here, let me read a passage from scripture that, that involves the same thing. It comes from Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Instead of a leap of faith this time, we're talking about a step of faith. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was against them. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer! It is I! Do not be afraid! And Peter answered to him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, Come! And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May God give his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this portion of Scripture. We know this story. It's the walking on water story. We find versions of it here in Matthew and in Mark 6 and also in John 6. I mean, barely a dozen verses in the whole Bible. And yet it's what everybody thinks about when they think of Jesus and his miracles. I mean, how many cartoons have been drawn? How many jokes have been made? Walking on water has come to be sort of a, a sign of holiness, in fact. But you know, this story really isn't about walking on water. That's just something that is used as a part of the story. The story uses this, and Jesus uses this whole idea of walking water to invite his followers into a confrontation. A confrontation between fear and faith in their own hearts. More than anywhere else in scripture, we can clearly see that face off. Fear. Faith. Now you might remember that the most common command in all scripture, we talked about this last week, the most common command in all scripture is don't be afraid. It's over 20 times in the Gospels. In the whole of the Bible, verses like fear not or be strong and courageous or don't be afraid, you can trust me, they appear in, in about 366 verses according to Bible teacher Lloyd Ogilvie. 
more than anything else, Jesus says, or God says, don't be afraid. Now, fear doesn't seem to be the most serious vice. I mean, it doesn't make the list of the seven deadly sins. No one gets disciplined in church for being afraid. Why does God tell human beings to stop being afraid more often than he tells us to do anything else? I mean, it could have something to do with the fact that we get afraid a lot. But why does God not want us to be afraid? It's more than just sparing us emotional discomfort. Fear is the number one reason that human beings are tempted to avoid doing what God asks them to do. And that's what I think it right, comes right down to it. Fear keeps us from discovering who God has made us to be. In this story, fear really appears. It, it rears its head twice. The disciples are afraid to begin with because they think they're alone in a storm, and then they think that they're not only alone, there's a ghost out there on the water with them. Peter then is called to face his fear directly when he's invited to step out of the relative safety of the boat onto the waves. Jesus says, though, courage, I am, fear not. Now, it's really interesting that Jesus uses the same words that God used in the Old Testament. When God appeared to Moses at the, bony, at the burning bush, he said, I am, when Moses asked him to identify himself. This I am has become a way that the people knew God in Jesus' day. It's this revelation of the I am God in their midst. God let Moses know who he was by these words. And it's repeated often in Scripture. And so that you can see all of what's entailed in, in the I am. For example, in Moses, in Moses, in Isaiah 43, we read, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are me. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. All of that's wrapped up in the meaning of these two little words, I am. And so Peter stands at the side of the boat. Trust says, jump. And fear says no. And just like my daughter did, Peter jumped. And for him, everything went smoothly until fear struck him a second time. And he saw the wind and he became frightened. His response immediately was to give in to fear and he lost his sense of confidence that Jesus was in charge of the situation. That happens when we get afraid. We, begin, we get forgetful as well. And so Peter sank in the water, and also in his own worry. Fear will sink us faster than anything else. It disrupts our faith. It becomes the biggest obstacle to trusting and obeying God. A, a man feels called to switch careers and do something bold for God, but, but fear holds him back. A woman feels trapped in a marriage that is painful and abusive, but she hasn't spoken about it, hasn't done anything about it. Why? Because fear keeps her from acknowledging the reality and seeking some kind of help. Another young woman feels pressured by her parents to make choices in her life that she doesn't really want to make, but, but fear keeps her from standing up to them. How, how many kinds of ways are there that fear has kept us from doing what we felt needed to be done. Now, fear sometimes is good for you. In fact, there's a very legitimate reason that fear exists. There's something useful about it. It's an internal warning cry that danger is nearby. It's meant to motivate us to take action to defend ourselves. Our, our, our body becomes involved because there's a physiological component to fear. We, we might notice sweaty palms. We might notice dry mouths. But it affects us in other ways, too. I mean, the fear process is centered not so much in our brain, but right in our nervous system that can detect danger within a tenth of a second of being perceived. 
That's how fast, a tenth of a second. It's, it's before any conscious process has a chance to begin. And so that speed helps us to respond immediately to potential trouble. This response isn't slowed down by, um, you know, it doesn't have to wait for a slower, rational understanding of what's going on. And so when this immediately, immediate response hits, the body goes into action. There's quick energy um, hormones like adrenaline that, that get pumped into the muscles and the bloodstream. Blood actually drains from your skin surface and is diverted to your large muscles, and so your skin might feel clammy. Um, and your large muscles have more blood in them, muscles like your legs, for a quick getaway in case you need it. Your heart pounds to enable your body to go into overdrive. Your eyes will widen with fear in order to take in the maximum amount of information. Other systems of your body that are not essential to the moment might temporarily shut down, in fact, to free us to take action. That's some of the things our body automatically does when we're afraid. Now, most fears are learned, but some of them are hardwired in us. Loud noises, extreme heights, those things are, are almost like they're hardwired into us, is what we understand. In fact, um, columnist Dave Barry wrote a few years ago, all of us are born with a set of instinctive fears. Fear of falling, fear of the dark, fear of lobsters, fear of falling on lobsters in the dark, uh, fear of speaking before the Rotary Club, and of course, the great fears of the words some assembly required. Yeah, that's Dave Barry. Anyway, uh, good fear, Good fear is fear that's a natural response for a moment of crisis. There's a moment that it is needed, and it's there, and then it's gone. But what if it doesn't go? See, the gift of our imagination, the imagination that we human beings have, it's wonderful, but it also makes the human mind more vulnerable to worry, because we can imagine all kinds of things going wrong, not just imagining the hope or the anticipation we may have. In some cases, our imagination is so strong that, that, and we get so used to it, that fear becomes a habit, and it makes someone into a chronic worrier to the point where they may experience fear over something that isn't actually fear, um, something actually to be afraid of. There isn't a threat, but you're afraid. And when that happens, fear can become paralyzing instead of motivating. You say that some people have a predisposition for it. Apparently, there's even a gene for fear. People who have a short version of the gene are more likely to worry than those who have a long version of this gene. And so now that you know that information, are you worried that you might have the short version? If you're worried about it, you might. No. So fear can become costly. Uh, the Bible suggests that fear generally uh, plays a destructive role in the lives of people. Fear as we usually experience is not a good thing. Fear is usually what threatens to keep people from trusting and obeying God. Here, here are some of the costs of it. One is, well, fear of our self-esteem. Uh, people lack self-esteem. Often people who are gifted, attractive, well-liked, accomplished, and yet they struggle with confidence in themselves. Why? Well, perhaps sometime in their history they faced a difficult situation. Now, if you're in that circumstance, you that situation, you take action, you feel a sense of accomplishment, you feel a sense of delight, you feel a sense of power. But if you avoid facing up to a threatening situation, even if things turn out all right, you always feel a little bit disappointed, a little bit like a failure for taking the easy way out. And then avoiders can become impression management specialists. We, we try to act in a way that we think will be acceptable to others. But we don't believe our own act. We think, well, I know better, and if you really knew me, me better, you wouldn't uh, like me either. But when you take on a challenge, 
when you face your fears and take them on, a lot of that sort of thinking is blocked. Even, even if the outcome is less than perfect. So I invite you to try it. Make a difficult phone call that you've been putting off. Make a tough decision. Stand up to a bully. When you do this, you'll find that you feel stronger inside. But if you avoid it, the fear could eat away at your confidence in yourself, but also your confidence in God's goodness. Other things, though, we lose in fear. One is a loss of destiny. Living in fear, you never get to experience the potential that God has placed in you. Because growth always involves risk, and risk, fear. Uh, we experience a loss of joy because fear drains us of contentment and, and it makes joy impossible. When you live in fear, there's a negative power that becomes overwhelming. You know, what if can be a magic word. What if this could happen and this could happen. It could be a dream, it could be expectation. Or what if can also be the worst thing that could happen. Joy and fear really are incompatible. And so when we're afraid, it drives out the joy. More than that, fear blocks authentic intimacy. Fear and hiding go together. The very first instance of someone hiding was when Adam hid from God and his explanation of it, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. I was afraid, so I hid. There it is, the first instance of fear, first instance of hiding. And humans have been hiding ever since. Behind smiles we don't feel and words we don't believe, hiding because we're afraid that somebody might think wrong of us or we're afraid that some conflict might occur and we'll find ourselves out of our depth. We hide behind walls that we make because relationships involve risk. And so we become isolated and alienated by fear. And we also lose our availability to God. When fear shapes our lives, safety becomes our God. And when safety becomes our God, our lives revolve around being safe. That leaves us little energy to do anything else. We begin to worship the risk-free life and we become useless to God because fear whispers to us that God isn't really big enough to take care of us. Fear causes us to distort the way we think about God. No wonder Jesus wages such a war against it. Finally, fear is dangerous because we spread it. It spreads, though, not only to others around us, it spreads generationally. We pass it on. We can fear a thing. We can fear a place. We can even fear people. And when we fear a group of people, it can become generational. And it can lead to the so sort of societal distrust that we are now facing in our world, where people find reasons to fear other people because they look differently. And then out of that grows all sorts of injustices and inequities because we're afraid of the other, of what's different. Fortunately, though, fear isn't the only thing that spreads. So does trust. A daring faith can be contagious. Peter takes a link, a leap into the into the into the sea, and then he begins to sink, but he's lifted up out of the water. Of course, that had to happen a few more times in his life. Um, where he was lifted up and restored through repeated forgiveness and restoration and courage that he found in Christ. He became the outspoken leader of this band of boat-hugging cowards. All of those guys who were too afraid to even try what Peter tried, they're the ones who ultimately changed the world because they caught the faith and the trust from Peter, even more so from Jesus. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear. Oh, there are frightening things out there. Fear may fill our world, but it doesn't have to fill our hearts. We tend to seek a world of comfort and of safety, the world that was there in the boat. But Jesus has called us out into active faith, out into trusting in his full deliverance, his assistance, and his power. Did you ever stop to think about it? That Jesus never walked on water except in the middle of a storm. Our responses determine the level of victory we experience in our lives. If we respond in fear, if we step back, you know, we might start to die a little bit inside. Because we don't ever remain just where we are. We move forward or we start to shrink back and we lose a chance to experience God. If we respond in faith, we may screw up, we may sink, but we'll have the joy of experiencing our courage and we'll be with Jesus. So the question is, what boat are you floating in? What storm is raging in your life at this time? What pool are you standing by the side of, wondering, should you take a leap or not? Jesus is in the water and he bids us to come. Do we dare? God is patient with us when we can't seem to leave the comfort of our boat. But what if you let your God-given imagination turn toward what God has in store rather than any of the possible disasters that you can think of? Can't you hear the voice of Jesus saying, come? Because if you want to walk on water, you really have to get out of the boat. Come on. Jump. That'll catch you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will fill our hearts with courage, the courage to be graceful and grace-giving, the, the courage to give ourselves to one another and to others, the courage, Lord, to give ourselves to you and to trust you. We pray, Lord, that you will step in and grab those fears in our lives and push them aside so that we might be open to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close by singing a great old hymn that really is based on that. Uh, my faith looks up to thee. It's uh, in our in our United Methodist hymnals, it's number 173, but the words are on the screen, so I invite you to look at best words, or if you want to, you don't have to sing, you can just listen. But uh, let me sing it, and uh, enjoy it if you will. My faith looks like it.
grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the love of God, our eternal Father, and the presence and the keeping of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. God bless you this week, folks. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us next week for our worship service on the lawn. Thank you for joining us online. God bless you.